of our own story, just like this particular character, and her name is Grace. Um, and like Grace, we see ourselves as the warriors, uh, or as this, well, this one is actually a Nazi the Spider-Man, that's how she sees herself on her adventures. Um, and we, see, we want to see ourselves as the heroes, the warriors, the bards, and sometimes the villains, but to have a multifaceted experience of our own lives. Until, uh, often as people, and specifically women of color, we begin to play with others. Uh, we go to school, we see movies and television, and we're inundated with images of people who don't look like us. We look at you know, images that whisper slowly in our subconscious, you don't belong. In this picture, Grace raises her hand because her teacher asked the class, who wants to play Peter Pan? And, and Grace, being the storyteller she is, raises her hand up high. That's me. The little boy next to her, Raj, says, you can't be Peter Pan. You're a girl. The little girl Nelly right next to her says, you can't be Peter Pan. Peter Pan's not black. And I think a lot of people have a familiar experience. In 1988, an educator named um, Emily Stiles discussed the idea um, in a paper of the curriculum as windows and mirrors. As a window, you get to see the version of the world through someone else's eyes. And as a mirror, you get to see yourself reflected. And her theory is that we need both, right? Um, and in sci-fi fantasy, in whatever medium, just like curriculum, it is contextual. It lives besides our own reality and bends and twists and reflects our beliefs back at us. And the genre as a whole is meant to be massive. It's meant to be like anything is possible. And um, one thing that's also really cool, as Emily Salas puts it, is that by glancing through the window with someone else's humanity, someone else's reality, we, the window can become a mirror and reflect ourselves, even if we don't we literally have Orcs and unicorns and you know witches that people of different colors and phenotypes would be familiar and normal, but we know that's not really the case. Um, and Emily Styles continues in her paper by saying, uh, white males often find in the house of curriculum many mirrors to look in, and um, women of color um, and men of color often see no mirrors. And by no mirrors, you are rendered invisible. Uh, thereby, white males are encouraged to be sophistic. It's hard to pronounce that word. Um, meaning, focused on the realities of their own feelings, own realities, to the detriment of other people. Because, like, my place is real because I see my reality reflected. I am real! And everyone else is like, am I real? No one is talking my reality. And so while this is specifically talking about diversity in children's books, I feel like it can be applied very much so across the board. Um, or, uh, as Mindy Cowling said when she did Press for a Wrinkle in Time, she said, I love science fiction and fantasy growing up, but it was a genre that largely didn't love me back. So the purpose of this panel is to show love. Uh, I want to show love to your beauty. I want to show love to your accomplishments and your fights. I want to show love to your tears and your insecurities. Um, I want to show love to your desire to be a fairy tale princess full of gowns and, and lovely things and your desire to be a fearless leader, you know, fighting for the liberation of your people. I want this, to, I want this panel to celebrate the warriors and the scientists and the doctors and the mothers and the teachers who helped made us feel a little bit more seen. So let's get cracking. You ready? <laughs> All right, first up, you know her, you love her, the amazing Michelle Nichols. <laughs> now, I know you've probably heard her stories a million times. Hopefully, you're going to hear it a million and one. Okay? So, um, Michelle Nichols, uh, you know, she played in the Explorer and Star Trek. She was the first black woman to have a main role in a television program. Uh, she, after the first season, was planning on leaving because she's a classically strained actress um, and singer and dancer. She wanted to go on Broadway. And um, before she left, she met Martin Luther King at a fundraiser. And he was her, one of her biggest fans, and he told her, 
I let the Star Trek is one of the few shows that I let my children watch because it shows a future where there's diverse people working together as equals. And she thanked him but told him that she was leaving. He said, you can't do that. He said, do you know what you mean to the black community? Do you know what you mean to little girls all over? And she ended up staying. One of the little girls that she inspired was a little girl named Karen Johnson. Karen, who was raised by a single mother in uh, the housing project in Manhattan, was around 10 years old when she saw Star Trek for the first time. And when she did, she ran to her home and said, Mama, you gotta come quick. There's a black lady on TV and she ain't no maid. <laughs> that encouraged Karen's lifelong love for the arts and performing. And eventually, Karen Johnson, known as Willie Goldberg, um, Eventually, she uh, made a name for herself in the early 1980s and mid-1980s as a revolutionary comic and an awesome dramatic actress. And then by the time Star Trek The Next Generation came around in 1987, um, no one believed that such a superstar like Whoopi Goldberg would want to be on some silly sci-fi show. And she met up with Gene Roddenberry and she told them, I was a I'm a Star Trek fan. I've been a Star Trek fan long before I was ever Whoopi Goldberg. And she recalled later that seeing a horror on television let her know that she could do anything. This is Gail Fisher. Gail Fisher uh, is a unique woman in her particular genre. She's kind of off genre, but I do need to talk about her because I discovered her in my research for uh, this particular panel. Um, she was the second black woman to have a main part um, in a television drama after Nichelle Nichols in 1968 in a drama called Max. It was a, a detective show. She's also the first woman of color to win an Emmy and a Golden Globe. And uh, she, just like Nichelle Nichols, knew that her role was important. Um, she said there in the 1972 interview, there are certain people who have no knowledge of black folks and maybe seeing her character, Peggy Fair, helps people understand that and she's proud to be part of that. Now she won her awards in uh, 1970. Sorry, I think, yeah, I think 1970. Sorry, they're only 1970s. And she won it for uh, an Emmy for an Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series. A woman of color wouldn't win the Emmy for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Drama Series until 2015, when Viola Davis won, 45 years after. Peggy got her Emmy. And in her speech, Viola Davis said that the only thing that separates women of color from everyone else is opportunities. We can't win Emmys for roles that aren't there. This is Gina Torres. You don't deserve Gina Torres, I don't deserve Gina Torres. <laughs> <laughs> I don't deserve Gina Torres, but we have her, and thank God for it. <laughs> That is totally the reason why this whole, why this slide is here. She is just everything. Like, tall, beautiful, Afro-Latina that just kicks ass. The world's observer, I don't observe her. Just love to do it. Love to do it. Woo! Yeah. Um, and actually, I do need to go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I had planned to do one more thing with Gail Fisher, because by the time that she um, passed away, um, her name was largely forgotten, and so was her story. So uh, there's something that I learned from uh, different artists working here in D.C. Uh, in a way of honoring her. So what I want to do is that I want to say her name, and then I want everyone to respond back, we honor your story. Got it? Gail Fisher. We honor your story. Thank you. Last person I want to talk about is Kristen. The reason why I want to talk about her is because there will be people in, uh, as you saw in the earlier slideshow, um, who may not obviously be uh, people of color or who may be um, biracial or multiracial. Kristen is actually um, half Chinese. Her mother is Chinese. Her father is Dutch. And what I find interesting about her is that while as Lana Lang, that was not something that was, you know, made clear, made obvious, she did the very questionable uh, Street Fighter movie. <laughs> um, 
but then she also is leading in her show Beauty and the Beast. And in both, in both characters are also biracial. Both characters have um, an Asian parent. And while I don't know for sure, I'd like to think that she you know, went to some people, because that was not necessarily required for a character in Beauty and the Beast. So I'd like to think she like went up to someone and said, hey, um, I'd like to play myself. Like, that'd be great. <laughs> um, so when you look at some of the, the long slide shows that I will show, again, there'll be people of mixed, uh, mixed and multiracial backgrounds who'll be there as well. Now, oh, now did you want to know how the story of Grace ended? <laughs> so after uh, Grace, um, that whole thing happened with her classmates, and she told her mom and her grandma. Her grandma took her to a show uh, in the city where she saw a stunning new black Juliet, her first black ballerina. She got so excited after seeing her performance that Grace just danced her way home. Because she spun around and spun around after she was ballerina and thought, I can do anything I want. And, in the end of the story, she kicks ass on her Peter Pan audition. <laughs> And it's most definitely pretty pain at the end of the story. That's what's been going on. I'll start. I'm Eva Brown. Uh, I'm a contributor with Black Girl Nerds, and I'll be cover Black Girl Nerds. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Jodhry. I am probably the least nerdy one here, and the least awesome one. I'm just a Kenny. Chem professor at a community college. Yes. Just a professor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one, my name is Halima. I have a, I'm a YouTuber. I have a channel, Hamlet TV, subscribe. And uh, I just cover cons and events around the area, and I have a wall doing it. Awesome. <laughs> I'm Nicole Homer. Um, I'm also a professor at a community college, so like that's what's up. Um, <laughs> I'm a poet and I am a, an editor at Black Nerd Problems and we look at pop, all pop culture uh, through a POC lens. Hi, I'm Sarah Lee Jones. I'm a writer and I'm also a poet. Uh, so uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate it so much. Uh, so we're just going to answer some questions and uh, we'll listen to your amazing answers. Uh, first of all, um, including uh, live action children's programs, um, who was the first girl or woman of color you remember seeing in sci-fi fantasy? And what was your reaction to them when you first saw them? And when you look back, what's your reaction to them now? <laughs> Amora, I mean, that's the, that's the biggest one. Um, but like to step outside of that, since you've kind of talked about her, Samus um, was so real for me as a kid, um, that she was the first girl that I saw, but also in a lot of the ways uh, her girlness was hidden, and that's the only reason she was acceptable, um, which I think is a thing that is duplicated when we're talking about characters of color. They're coded not as people of color, so that they can be accepted. Well, for me, it was uh, Whoopi's character. You know, that's who I saw first, because my mom is a general mistress. <laughs> and for me, what I remember about her is just her outfits were just fabulous, her hair, <laughs> Looked like my hair, okay, and she was powerful, she was respected, people looked for her for advice, she was a rule breaker, giving everybody libations when she shouldn't have, you know? <laughs> she, she just was integral to the plot and she was well respected and she looked fabulous and she just never hid herself or her power. So now, that's how I saw her then. Now I just look at her as still an inspiration, just somebody that I would like to emulate because, yes, her. Her fashion was fabulous. <laughs> I love fabulous fashion. But also, she was proud of who she was. She wasn't intimidated by anyone. I mean, how many people stood up to Q? Come on now. Okay, so, yes, that, that's who I admire. I actually, that was mine too. The first person of color, I mean, woman of color that I saw on TV was Whoopi Goldberg. And I come from a culture where it was either you saw a ton of white people or you saw a ton of Indian people. You didn't really see a lot of Pakistanis anyway. So when I saw Whoopi, I was like, damn, she's awesome. <laughs> and she actually was, in my opinion, that's just my opinion, she was like the smartest person on Star Trek. 
And I thought it was so cool that Picard would go to her for the most intense discussions. And that she was the one that knew instantly what someone would need, what someone would not want. And I was like, I want to be that smart. I want to be that cool. So that was mine. Uh, it was probably a horror for me as well, but also, I guess, uh, the first uh, Battlestar Galactica, they had these two episodes where they had all these women who got to be Viper pilots, and so Sheila Willis was one of those, and so she was the first black, you know, uh, fighter, you know, that I saw um, on Battlestar Galactica, so uh, Sheila Willis was so cool. Awesome. Uh, I would say uh, Whoopi Goldberg for me, too. Um, I remember watching Star Trek with my grandfather and just being like, oh my gosh, she is so smart, she is so cool. And just like, I would, I would like, like, I enjoyed everyone, but I would be like waiting for like the one scene with Gaina that happened every five episodes. But I would be waiting for it. I wanted it to happen. Um, so, uh, this, is, this is kind of a similar question, but I'm curious if there are any different answers. So, who are like the top maybe two characters who have inspired you either personally or professionally um, and why? So I would say uh, Gina Torres as Zoe um, because she was just badass. Um, she was unapologetically badass. Um, she was also in the relationship. She was the protector. Um, and for those of us who were tomboys or who were um, maybe pushed the boundaries of gender, that was really nice to see in a body that reflected something that I could identify with. Um, and then similarly, um, Auntie Entity. Like, first of all, legs. Um, like, goals forever. Um, I'm going to do squats when I leave here. Um, but, like, she was in charge. And for me, I don't think, I, I like the intersection of, like, women who looked like me or who looked like women I was related to, but also who were empowered and embodied that power and were not afraid to act on it, who were autonomous and made decisions. Um, I mean, and Zoe defied Malcolm all the time, right? Like, and that's part of it. It's not your second in command, and so you listen. It's your second in command, and so steel against steel is sharpened, and that requires her to be steel. And that mm. requires her to be strong in her own right. Mm. Um, and that's the, the same for um, Auntie Anthony. I don't know. Uh, for me. Hey. <laughs> so, for me, it's a little bit offbeat, but. Uh, Kendra from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, she became a slayer, guys. I mean, wow. You know, she had the powers when poor Buffy died and went to hell. <laughs> you know, bless her heart. Sorry, Buffy. That really was terrible. But hello, Kendra. And you know, I mean, for for a hot brief minute there, you had a slayer of color, and that just meant a lot to me in school just to see her. So that she inspired me. And uh, Astrid from Springe. Okay, because she just, I mean, she had agency, she had her hair, hello, <laughs> you know, and as the series wore on, they became, they came to rely on, on, on her so much, you know, she didn't kind of just disappear into the background, they needed her, and she was integral to the plot and solving issues, so she just, she just inspired me a lot as well. So, mine are, I feel like they're real off to the side, but mine is the yellow Power Ranger. I love her. Okay, which one? Trini, Aisha, Tanya, you got to The first one. Trini. Trini. I thought it was so cool. She wasn't one of those, you know, damsels in distress that I saw growing up in Disney. She could kick ass and she could get have the greatest hair you ever. I thought that was amazing. I was like, you can do everything that you want. Um, and then my second one was uh, oh, you saw Stargate, right? Atlantis. Mm -hmm. uh, I love that woman so much. Because in my opinion, uh, when I was growing up, it was more like, you know, you have to have a family, you have to settle down, you have to grow, uh, you know, have your kids. She did all of that, and she went on missions, and she had a gun, and she <laughs> knew what the hell she was doing. And sometimes, not sometimes. A lot of times, she was the one that was saving all of them, those men's butts. <laughs> so those were two that I found really inspirational. 
So I'm older than all of them. I'm old enough to be their mothers. Um, so to be perfectly honest, when I was coming up, there wasn't anybody but Michelle Nichols. It was her. And so, and I sort of objected to the fact that she was just a communication and every once in a while she would kiss Kirk and then she would, the halo frequencies would be open. So, um, you know, so for me, this is important and I'd love to hear how much this influenced you. I did go on to become an engineer, but it, it, it's, it was very, very hard because there were no models of us uh, and, it, so it was just sort of disappointing, I guess, you know, for me coming up. And it wasn't until maybe I was in my in high school that we started to actually get women of color who were not secondary, who weren't props um, in television. So. I think the, re the reboot was important for that because it expanded her role so much and it's like, oh, you're more than a secretary. And yeah. You're doing something that's really important that it is vital. Like, you were literally the only reason that we are able to communicate with these other people. Right, but I, I still... That. For me, I still think it's an issue because, you know, we're all sort of in science fields. Um, I think it's still important for you to actually see us saving the day, and I don't think you necessarily have to be a warrior either. And so it was sort of, it's sort of for me, I don't think we're there. I love all these characters, but I'm still, um, you know, uh, less than um, a percentage of female engineers, or female, black female engineers. All right, so we've made all this thing, and now we can kick butt, we can kill zombies, but we can't do math. So, um, you know, for me, I think it's still an issue with representation. That's why one of the, um, I don't know if you guys remember the show Extend with the Halle Berry. Yes. Yeah. I loved it, and she was, I mean, she was saving the day. She wasn't a kick-ass warrior or anything like that, but she was smart, and her smarts helped her, to, you know, try and figure out what was going on with her. So that's. It was, I was really sad when it was canceled, but, you know, she, she, it should have gone on a bit longer because I think her character would have, uh, you know, would have made a bigger impact. You know, you guys make me think of something, um, when, when it comes to the characters who, uh, I admire, I also admire your training, um, and my from Power Rangers, who's the, my absolute favorite, because, yes, yeah, she was a kick-ass warrior, but she was also extremely smart just extremely smart and extremely capable. And I was like, oh my God, you can do everything. <laughs> um, and while it's kind of off topic because we've been talking and the focus of here is um, kind of live action television, uh, Keisha from Magic School Bus was <laughs> awesome. <laughs> you know, thinking of, you know, girls of color who were smart, who could keep up, who was like, I was just like, Yes, Kendra, you are exactly who I see myself as when I'm in school. You know, so just just thinking, for, you know, but thinking so much as representation. And, you know, with this panel, yes, I totally agree. I feel like we're not, like, quote unquote, there yet, wherever there is. But it's also, I think, important for us to acknowledge that, you know, we're not where we are. We're not where. increasing in our ranks in STEM fields. It's actually decreasing well, as far as our percentage of the overall population. So I would hope that as we do more and we see ourselves better represented, that we don't just dress as our heroes, but we go to school to become our heroes. You know, we need more Mae Jamesons. You know, we need more women of color in science doing those types of things. And, uh, so, uh, you know, for me, that's what science fiction, I'm into science fiction and I'm an engineer because I wanted to make a transporter. You know, I, I, I'm that kid, so um, I would hope that it would sort of get us there, not just be on the fantasy, but into translating that into uh, actual advantage for our community. Um, in, the, uh, in the, and this happens in, you know, sci-fi television, but also happens definitely in real life, um, women of color are often kind of like the one in the group, right? And so what do you think are the consequences, positive or negative, of that characterization slash reality? I'll start. I think sometimes uh, it, it becomes, we don't get to see ourselves um, in relationships with ourselves. 
we're always that one um, person call in the room, and that that gorgeous white guy that you get to, you know, uh, you know. So I, I don't know. I, I would hope that that there's more than us, just us in the room, and we get to actually be in relationships with our in our community. Not that we don't like gorgeous white men, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I see you guys. Anybody <laughs> <that's too laughs> They don't take me to the street them outside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My boyfriend's not here, so. <laughs> I've actually lived it, so I have been that one person surrounded by, you know, other people, um, or I've been the one that has to represent my own culture and my own religion as well. Um, exhibit A right here. <laughs> But um, I feel like the advantage is that at least I get to speak. Um, not, I, I always say, I'm not speaking for everyone, I'm just speaking for myself. And I feel like I can at least you know, present that viewpoint and show people who I really am through my culture, through my religion. But then the con part of it is I feel like the whole pressure is on me. And then I have to you know, make sure I represent everything properly, accurately. Make sure no one gets the wrong impression. Make sure I'm actually saying things that are right. So I. It's wrong. It's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just <laughs> So yeah, before your mom called me, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, that's. Uh, I feel like that's probably the. You have to find that balance, and that's something that I myself have had to go through my pretty much my entire life. The example is right here. You love going to cons where you're surrounded by people that like the things that you that you like, but also, you know, does you discover new and different things, you know, fandoms that you didn't know about. That's what happens when you're represented, you know, you can find ways. So when you just have that one person, they have that pressure of being everything to everyone. And that particular person might not be, maybe that person is really just wants to chill and just wants to be in the corner and just observe. Maybe that person is a badass and just wants to go around and just, you know, do different things. But because you're that one person, just like you said, you, you feel pressure to okay, you have to act properly and, and just, you know, make sure I don't embarrass everybody and let the whole team down and get disinvited from the cookout, basically. Okay, so, you know, when somebody is just there and they're, or the extreme opposite is when you have that one person of color that's in there, and they're just there, just in the background, to just go, hey, we're the first show, woo -hoo. But they don't do anything, they don't say anything, or they have that one line of, it's over there! And then that's it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, yes, that's basically it, yeah. <laughs> Let me text my mom now and tell him on my panel. <laughs> only one black woman on a show or one woman of color, even if she is a one a three-dimensional character, we tend to latch on to the one dimension of her that we identify with the most and she doesn't get a chance to be um, well-rounded. Um, so like when I'm talking about Zoe, I will talk about how much she's a badass because that's what I needed her to be when I saw her. But we don't talk about how she's a bad, well we do, but I mean I, I didn't focus on it, how she's a badass, but also she wants this family. Right. And she's multi-dimensional. So not only the pressure to be one thing, but we tend to, if there's only one person of color, we reduce them to one thing. Is and it it's us? the one thing that we need. Is it us or is it that the directors made them into what they think an acceptable person of color is? I think that it's I both. It's because I think, like, Auntie Entity is a city manager, but that's not what I think of when I think about her. Right. Niobe is the best pilot in the Matrix universe, but that's not what I think about when I think about her. Mm -hmm. And it's not that that's not in the source material. And it's not that that's not presented, but that's not what I need her to be. And if there were a lot of women, then I wouldn't need her to be the one, one thing. Um, to, and to go to your idea um, about female friendships, so um, disclaimer, I kind of am over the walking yet. Um, even though <laughs> I will be, I will be hate watching it tonight. And my YouTube, like join me by hate watching this evening. Um, but the most interesting thing for me was when we had Michonne, Sasha and Rosita wandering through a forest trying to rescue Sasha who was clearly 
suffering from post-traumatic stress uh, syndrome, and nobody else cares about her, but it's these three women of color taking care of each other, and for me, this is the most compelling part of the show, because then Sasha gets to be hurt, as opposed to having, having to be strong, as she's had to be in the past, because there are more, there's more than one woman of color, so she can, for me, she can do those things. So I think it's both. I think that's one of the reasons I really like Black Lightning right now is because, you know, uh, I, I got to read my school Really? Yes. This year, Jealousy. Go get so I'm telling you. Get hugged too. Just oh, yeah. Oh, my God. It looks not the same. Um, <laughs> but um, I like the fact that you have the mother neurosurgeon, you have the daughter pre med the scholar athlete that just doesn't sort of know where she's going and it's, it's sort of an opportunity for you to find yourself in the Pierce family. Mm -hmm. you know, right. you really and they're allowed to. to make mistakes and right. try and figure out who they are. They're not that perfect model minority for black people. Right, right. You're right. Yeah. And, and they're trying to figure themselves out. And it's okay to not be the perfect minority. You're not you're not the token and you're also <laughs> not the you know Martin Luther King of your office either. <laughs> Um, and I was actually going to another question, but like you guys kind of already answered, I was going to ask you about um, how the different characterization of a uh, woman of color um, kind of interacts with stereotypes. As okay, so we only have a few more minutes left. Um, do we have any questions in the audience for our panel? Uh, yes. Um, I think that you know, given the range of people that we're talking about, you know, we were progressively getting better. Um, but I'm, I wonder if there's a portrayal or a show that's kind of makes you question all the things that you've loved before. Like right now, the expanse is like killing everything because I'm like all these missed opportunities. And, and so I'm wondering if there has been like an experience where you've like, they really got this right. I wish they could have done this in other iterations in Stargate or in, you know, in Sleepy Hollow or whatever. Walking Dead, obviously. For me, it was Space Above and Beyond with, uh, um, I forgot what her name is, but she played Danvers. I thought that was the first, yeah, yeah. I think I, that was the first time where I got to see a warrior, and uh, and I liked the fact that she was part of the crew, all of the type of things, and you got to see the progression. And then they just dropped the show, so that was one where I thought if they had continued on, it could have been. Yeah. For me, this is a show that's actually currently going on, the current Star Trek. I love Michael Burnham. I think that she is fantastic. I love the fact that, once again, she is not perfect. You know, she's just trying, she's, she's struggling between the two parts of her. And I really feel that they're getting that right. I feel that she's made really bad choices, but who has not? Who hasn't? And then she has a, she's got a second chance. And she's powerful, she's in relationship, she's doing her thing, but I really, really like She's in a relationship with Clean Up. That's nasty. Well, you know, the heart wants what the heart wants. <laughs> He's taken by that other lady. Yeah, but that <laughs> And then also, um, Sensei, one of my favorite shows. Why, people? Just crowdfund then, okay? If it's so expensive, crowdfund. And for me, it was uh, Cephas, his mom. She lives in the slum, but she raised a fantastic, loving son. All right, she is sick. She, is, she has a deadly disease, but she's still living her life. She's also in relationships with this kind of sort of bad guy, good guy, who knows? But, you know, I really liked her, her portrayal, and I just wish that they would continue with Sensei because I love that show so much. Um, I know for me, um, and it's a kind of a weird thing that I felt like they got this right when people questioned me. Um, I loved Dark Angel so much when it came out. I loved um, Jessica Alba playing Max Guevara, um, especially, particularly the first season. Um, and what I loved about her, and for me it was one of like, my first um, times where I really saw something that felt that was like urban fantasy. Like, I loved the fact that she struggled to pay her rent. I love the fact that she had a crappy ass job. I love the fact that she had friends of multiple ethnicities and races who had their own problems that we got to read. I love that she hated her boss. And that she had a past and a background 
which kept on influencing her current world. And she had this drive to find her family, her multi-ethnic family at that. And you know what family meant to her. And so there was a there was a level of I felt gravity and groundedness in especially like the first season, which I really didn't find other places. You know, I really felt the the weight of you know Max's history and also her desires. Like I, um, there's this uh, one particular episode where she's supposed to go somewhere with Logan and he's like mulching on her and she's pissed. And then she's like. I hung upside down, I did all these things, just so I had to go on vacation, you're not backing out. And I'm like, yes, I understand that pain. You know, or she's talking to him and he's like trying to do something and she's like, I know you're feeling this way, but I would welcome you not to be like a basic white dude right now. <laughs> and like she says it to his face and it's like, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's accurate. I understand those emotions. And that, so yeah, that's, that was one for me. I think for me, it's that Netflix show that's out, Sense8. Uh, um, you guys seen it? Well, my, for me, that's, and I could be wrong from what I remember from Star, from Sci-Fi, for me, that's gonna be the first South Asian woman who has a main role. She's not like some side character off to the side and you find out later on that she was Indian. They try to hide it, <laughs> make up or whatnot. So this, for me, I want to see what they do with this character. I want to see if they'll actually grow that character, if they'll, you know, toss in a Bollywood number for no apparent reason. <laughs> just for the sake of Okay, all for no reason. <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, for me, I want to see how that character grows. Because, like I was saying, growing up, I didn't see a ton of people that look like me, but now there's more out there and there's more people and I like to see where it goes. Well, I think that's time for us, so uh, thank you to my amazing panel. Let's thank you guys. Thank you audience for being here. Um, please uh, support diverse stories, diverse characters, and uh, enjoy the rest of the con. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.